Introduction to the Global Investment Performance Standards or GIPS. A lot of this lecture has been extracted from the curriculum. Here is what we will cover. Why were the GIPS standards created? Who can claim compliance? Who benefits from compliance? We'll talk about the concept of composites, verification, and finally, briefly touch on the structure of the GIPS standards. These standards are then discussed in the next reading. Why were the GIPS standards created? GIPS standards were created to make it easy to compare different investment management firms. Without a standard, different firms would select the method which would make them look good. Here are some common misleading practices and let's understand what each one of these mean. Let's say that we are considering three different investment management firms and each of these firms are not GIPS compliant. So obviously what they will try to do or possibly what they will try to do is present their performance information in a way that makes them look as good as possible. So what firm A might do is pick the five accounts out of let's say the 50 that are managed and pick these five accounts based on the ones that have performed the best over the last few years. By presenting information related to these five accounts or by presenting the performance related to these five accounts and not the remaining, firm A will be overstating its performance record and that clearly would be misleading. Another incorrect practice is based on survivorship bias and we see this concept in other parts of the curriculum. Let's say that firm B is presenting performance numbers over the last 10 years and it is only considering clients or portfolios that are active today. The clients who have left the firm over the last 10 years are not included in the performance report. If you think about it, the clients that left possibly left because the performance was not very good. And if the firm is claiming that the performance numbers being shown today are based on the last 10 years, then it would be misleading to not include the performance numbers for clients who have left the firm over the last 10 years. So what survivorship bias does is that it causes the performance, reported performance numbers to be overstated. And finally, varying time periods. Let's say that for investment firm C, the returns over the last three years were excellent, but returns before that were not so good. What firm C might then do is only present numbers for the last three years. So you can see that there are so many different ways of misleading the readers of the performance information that there clearly was a need for a set of standards for reporting performance. And that is the gap that GIPS helps fill. Here is a formal definition and I think it will be useful for you to learn this. The GIPS standards are a practitioner driven set of ethical principles that establish a standardized industry wide approach for investment firms to follow in calculating and presenting their historical investment results to prospective clients. The GIPS standards ensure fair representation and full disclosure of investment performance. In other words, the GIPS standards lead investment management firms to avoid misrepresentation of performance and to communicate all relevant information that prospective clients should know in order to evaluate past results. Who can claim compliance? Only investment firms that actually manage assets 
can claim compliance. Now let's say that you are an investment consultant and you advise others on what stocks to buy and what not to buy. As a consultant, you cannot claim GIPS compliance. On the other hand, if there is this firm that gets money from clients and actually manages that money, then this firm can claim GIPS compliance. This word can is important and this suggests that complying with GIPS standards is voluntary. In other words, just because a particular firm manages money, it is an investment management firm, doesn't mean that it has to comply with the GIPS standards. Compliance is a firm-wide process that cannot be achieved on a single product or composite. This is also an important point and there are two terms here that and there are two terms here that we'll discuss in more detail later. One is the firm. What is the definition of a firm? This will be covered in the next reading. Also the definition of a composite. This will be covered later in this reading and then also in the next reading. A firm has only two options with regard to compliance with the GIPS standards. One option is fully comply with all requirements of the GIPS standards and claim compliance through the use of the GIPS compliance system. The other option is to not comply with all requirements of the GIPS standards and not claim compliance with or make any reference to the GIPS standards. In other words, a firm can't say that it is partially compliant or a firm can't say that we are GIPS compliant except for standard 5A. It is an all or none. Who benefits from compliance? Essentially, Investment management firms and investors both benefit from compliance. Let's discuss investment management firms first. By choosing to comply with the GIPS standards, investment management firms assure prospective clients that the historical track record they report is both complete and fairly presented. Compliance enables the GIPS compliant firm to participate in competitive bids against other compliant firms throughout the world. Achieving and maintaining compliance may also strengthen the firm's internal controls over performance related processes and procedures. Investors also benefit from GIPS compliance. Investors have a greater level of confidence in the integrity of performance presentations of a GIPS compliant firm and can more easily compare performance presentations from different investment management firms. While the GIPS standards certainly do not eliminate the need for in-depth due diligence on the part of the investor, Compliance with the standards enhances the credibility of investment management firms that have chosen to undertake this responsibility. This ties back to the point I made earlier about investment firms A, B and C. As an investor, if you are confident that all three are reporting their performance numbers using the same set of standards, then it becomes much easier for you to compare them. Composites. A composite is an aggregation of one or more portfolios managed according to a similar investment mandate, objective or strategy. Let's consider a simple example. Say you have a group of clients who are young and they are well off financially and they are primarily interested in stocks which are likely to increase in value substantially. So let's say that we categorize this group as equity investors and within equity, they are interested in growth stocks. 
If you combine the various portfolios which fall in this strategy, in other words, equity and within equity growth oriented stocks. So this is one strategy. You might have another strategy that is still based on stocks, but focuses on value stocks. There might be another portfolio that is based on fixed income securities, which have primarily been issued by the government. So what you can see here is that there can be several different kinds of strategies or objectives when we combine the portfolios that fall within a particular mandate objective or strategy. The group of those portfolios is called a composite. A composite must include all actual fee paying discretionary portfolios managed in accordance with the same investment mandate objective or strategy. Now this is also important. The composite must include all fee paying discretionary portfolios. We've already talked about this part related to the fact that the same mandate objective or strategy is being followed. But the additional qualification here is that all these accounts must be actual. This means that if there is a particular portfolio, that's a dummy portfolio in the sense that this portfolio is not actually owned. It is just a sample portfolio, which says that if we had invested in so and so stocks or if we had invested in the S&P 500, then the return would be this much. Here we are talking about portfolios where actual money is invested. Fee paying, let's say that a particular portfolio is for a charitable organization and that charitable organization does not pay a fee for the management of its particular portfolio then that particular portfolio for which the client is not paying any fee will not be or should not be included in a composite. Discretionary portfolios. This means that the portfolios in the composite must be portfolios where the investment management firm has discretion over what securities to buy and what not to buy. If there is, for example, a portfolio where the client defines what securities can be purchased as part of this particular portfolio, then the portfolio is not discretionary and should not be included in the composite. The determination of which portfolios to include in the composite should be done according to pre-established criteria, not after the fact. I talked here about two different kinds of equity based portfolios, growth and value. The definition of which stock would fall in this composite and what would fall in this composite, or in other words, which portfolio would fall in each composite needs to be defined beforehand. A firm cannot decide after the fact whether a particular portfolio is in this composite or the other composite. As you will see later, the definition of a composite is important because performance numbers are reported based on composites. Verification. Firms that claim compliance with the GIP standards are responsible for their claim of compliance and for maintaining that compliance. A firm that is GIPS compliant can simply declare that it is GIPS compliant. Once a firm claims compliance with the standards, they may voluntarily hire an independent third party to perform a verification. So notice again, just as GIPS compliance is voluntary, similarly verification is voluntary and verification must be done by an independent third party. The verification is performed with respect to an entire firm. If a firm has multiple divisions or multiple departments, it cannot be said that only one department has been verified. When a firm is verified, it has to be for the entire firm. What does a verification test? Here are the main points. A verification tests whether the investment firm has complied with all the composite construction requirements of the GIP standard on a firm wide basis. And number two, whether the firm's policies and procedures are designed to calculate and present performance in compliance with the GIPS standards. I've mentioned this earlier, but it's important enough that it's being repeated here. 
verification must be performed by an independent third party. A firm cannot perform its own verification. Third party verification brings additional credibility to a firm's claim of compliance. This is self-evident. We've talked about the fact that verification is voluntary. You might wonder why then would a firm spend money on getting a third party to do the verification. And the answer is right here. If you are an investor, where would you be more comfortable with firm A that simply claims Gibbs compliance or firm B that claims Gibbs compliance and then has a reputable third party also verify the Gibbs compliance. Obviously, you would be more comfortable with firm B and that will give firm B an advantage over A. The structure of the Gibbs standards. The provisions within the 2010 version of the Gibbs standards are divided into nine sections. And this, by the way, is the current Gibbs standard that is being followed. These are the nine provisions. This is eight, but we start with zero. In the next reading, we will focus on section zero, which is fundamentals of compliance. We just need to understand all these other standards at a high level. For each of these provisions, there are certain requirements and there are also certain recommendations. And at least for provision zero, fundamentals of compliance, we will go through both the requirements and the recommendations. For the other provisions, we will look at the details when we do level three. That is it for this reading. In the next reading, we will talk about GIPS in a little more detail.